also this year. Yeah, we talk so much about gender equality, talking about generational equality, gender parity, and so much about it. Uh, uh, what exactly are the issues at stake here? The, the issue at stake is development. Mm. <laughs> as far as uh, we at Young Women are concerned, we're really talking about the development of our communities, of our countries. And uh, we believe, and we, we have evidence to show the countries that actually invest in the education of girls, invest in the empowerment of women and their full contribution to societies are actually the, the most, the healthiest societies, um, societies where, um, you know, which meet the development targets that we are trying to meet. We have uh, our SDGs and we recognize that, you know, you can't develop uh, a country when half of the productive resources of that the human capital resources remain underdeveloped. And so when we talk about um, gender equality, we're not just talking about it for the sake of it. We're talking about it because our countries, our development, our survival depends on it. And um, we, 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 we are so far behind in, 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 in terms of uh, what we need to do to lift our countries out of poverty. Um, to bring um, equality in terms of the voices of women in decision making. So when we talk about bringing women into the, the space of development of politics, it is because we want to improve um, the overall health, wealth and well-being of the people of our countries. And, and, and that is what underlines this. And we also have an obligation because all our governments have committed to respect the rights of women uh, equally. Um, you know, in Beijing, one of the big um, mottos of Beijing was women's rights are human rights. That it was in Beijing, China, that we actually, um, for once and for all, recognized that when we talk about women's rights, we are talking about human rights, which is the bedrock of the UN Charter. Uh, to which all our countries, Nigeria included, have signed on to. So essentially we're talking about development, we're talking about progress, uh, we're talking about peace for all, all citizens of our countries. And um, in Nigeria, uh, we do have to, with the size of, 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 of the country that it is, we cannot afford to leave, leave anyone behind. Uh, we're a population of 100 million women. Imagine what 100 million empowered women can, can do to country. turn around uh, yeah. the fortunes of this country. So it's, it's not an option and it's not a favor to women. It's, it's a responsibility and it's a necessity for all our governments to actually invest in this. Yeah, uh, you, you, you talk about the Benji um, declaration. I think one of the fallouts of that declaration was the 35% affirmative action, I want to believe. Uh, okay, so Beijing actually, um, what uh, the Beijing conference noted yeah. was that in order to have a critical mass, emphasis on a critical mass of, of uh, uh, women in any decision-making space, because evidence has also shown that, you know, un until and unless you have a critical mass yeah. of anyone, whether it's young people or women or even men in a context where the women are the majority, your voices and your perspectives may not uh, influence decisions that much. So, so Beijing uh, highlighted 30% as the, the minimum to ensure a critical mass. So that 30% is not even the, 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 the ultimate. Uh, the ultimate is 50%. Okay. And that, uh, since Beijing, since that time, uh, 25 years ago, the African Union has actually uh, adopted in the Solemn Declaration on Gender a 50% um, participation for all member states. Nigeria was very active in, in those negotiations that led to the African Union to adopt that. So 50% is what we aim for, and that is what we should uh, 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 strive for. Beijing just uh, noted that 30% is where you need to have a critical mass of women in decision making. But I must say that um, in doing the analysis 25 years later, globally, we're still around 24% of women in decision making. In parliaments, you know, women make up only about 24 
percent of parliaments around the world. There are certain parliaments that have exceeded that, that have exceeded 50 percent, like Rwanda. Uh, it's, it's great to know that the country that has the highest number of women in parliament is an African one, and it's Rwanda. Uh, countries like Senegal also have done very well, uh, almost 50 percent and so on. But um, generally, it's 24 percent on average. But as we all know, in Africa, sadly, very sadly, Nigeria has the lowest, which is under 5 percent. So Globally or in Africa? In Africa, but, but that doesn't help us globally either. So <laughs> it means that globally in Nigeria, we have one of the lowest wow. representation of women, but in Africa, we certainly have the lowest. And, and we all look up to Nigeria um, as a leader, yeah. as a giant. And uh, I think, you know, leadership by example is what all African countries will strive for. So even um, from that point of view, it's really important that Nigeria invest in ensuring in, in the law. And I think what the other thing we've also noted uh, globally is that those countries that have done well are countries that have actually adopted legislation to guarantee mm. a minimum representation of women in their parliaments and in decision making. And we don't have that in Nigeria. Yeah, I was actually going to ask what should Nigeria be doing differently if we must uh, uh, get to this uh, gender parity level. But first of all, maybe we should talk about uh, what um, actually responsible. You probably must have identified some of the barriers, some of the uh, things that are militating against women climbing to that very level in society, particularly in Nigeria. What have you been able to, uh, to, uh, to identify? So I think in, in Nigeria, as in many of our African countries, you know, um, Sometimes uh, culture, tradition, interpretation of, of, of religious mm. texts and so on are some of the factors that are used to hold women back. Mm. So culture plays uh, a, a strong part in, in this. Of course, we, all, we are all products of our culture. We all em embrace our culture and our traditions. Uh, but we also know that culture is dynamic. Culture mm. is not static. And that at, at all times, we need to be examining our culture and looking at the barriers or the, fact, mm -hmm. the, the elements of our cultural practices that may uh, be um, negative to, to the advancement of the entire community. Sometimes we hide behind that. Sometimes we hide behind um, uh, religion. But I think we know that from... Um, so let me take the issue of early marriage. So I'm, take, I'm starting from when a child is very young. Mm. Um, we have a situation where over 40% of girls in this country get married before the age of 18. That's quite a lot of um, uh, uh, girls who don't have an opportunity to further their education so that they can actually be productive. When you have girls getting married at the age of 13, their bodies are not even fully developed at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, there are all kinds of health consequences uh, uh, related to that. You're not developing the full potential of this human being to contribute to the society. Um, so the, right from the, the early stage, and one of the things that Beijing uh, highlighted was also investment in the girl child. So we need to look at the, the barriers uh, from the educational system from the, the cultural uh, and traditional factors that inhibit us. Violence is also a very uh, Im uh, important uh, contributor to, mm. to, to what holds women back as well. Um, what cultural practices, but even domestic violence and so on, um, threats of violence, uh, sexual harassment, all these things, uh, all these factors that continue to hold women back. We also have situation where when women are also not uh, educated, they don't have the best jobs. Most women are in the informal sector of the economy. Um, and, and, you know, protection, social protection becomes an issue. They, you know, they're more vulnerable um, to, to all forms of exploitation as well. So I think, um, and then poverty. You know, poverty has a, a, a feminine face, but that's also because that's also linked to the fact that um, when women, when we don't invest in, in women being in, uh, educated, they grow up to be the majority of those who are in the category of poor. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at the entire system. 
from from education to the health of women we have a situation where you know every 10 minutes a woman in nigeria dies in childbirth maternal mortality is still a very huge problem here uh, so whether it's in health whether it's in education whether it's in uh, opportunities to participate in in politics and decision making we've seen that even when women are bold uh, they are educated they're bold they have want money and they want to participate in these processes they they are still bullied uh, out of the uh, out of the uh, process so um, there needs to be a mindset change on on the part of our men mm. uh, to understand that bringing women into uh, the decision making space empowerment of women generally is actually to something that is benefit beneficial to all of society mm. it's not women taking over men's roles mm. it's really we both sharing the responsibility to to develop this country and that mindset shift um, uh, is, is is key and that is why we invest in programs such as he for she also because we recognize that as much as we push and even women push for their rights uh, we're not going to get that until the men also come and work side by side with us to bring about the necessary change. Yeah, you, you spoke about uh, uh, the exploit of Rwanda. Um, part of the process was that they have to legislate this. And uh, in Nigeria, we have not done that quite all right. But there's also this notion in Nigeria that uh, power is not self a la carte. That if you need power, you have to go take it, you have to go grab it. Uh, do you think you're going to see a situation whereby uh, there will be legislation to that effect in Nigeria, or maybe the women just have to come mobilize themselves to get power. I think, I hope, and that's what uh, we, we work to promote at the UN, is I hope there will be legislation. Um, but, you know, the path to getting that legislation may require different strategies. Mm. So there may be women, uh, there may be a need for women to mobilize and, and strengthen the, the demands. Uh, build broader alliances, mm -hmm. alliances with men, with the young, with market women, with rural populations, mobilize um, the whole country mm -hmm. really to be behind this need for legislation. But I, I, I do believe that it is possible. Uh, and and uh, the, the question is about what strategy. And I don't think there is one one path necessarily. I think we need to look at um, the work that has to go on um, with the political actors um, behind the scenes, the negotiations that has to go on. But there has to be the education of the public also. And, and that will include uh, mobilizing everybody to, to, to be behind this call for legislation in Nigeria. And I believe that it, 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 it is possible when people understand also what it is, what, is, what does having a gender bill or whatever, you know, uh, or a, a bill that uh, guarantees a, a certain representation of women, what does it take from you? Mm. What does it add to your situation? And I think that uh, conversation, that education, for people to see that it's actually in their best interest and in the interest of the whole country to have a parliament that is more representative, to have a parliament where when, um, they can see themselves and their issues and their needs in, in, in the representatives who they send to the states or, or national assemblies. And, and, and I think the country will be healthier and stronger for it, ultimately. Yeah, Ma, do, you, do you think the women are communicating their message appropriately in terms of how they are driving it? Because some of our checks reveal that most of the men feel threatened when women keep talking about uh, give us equality, uh, give us this power. Why should uh, men feel threatened? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the cultural um, um, aspect of all of these things. So do you think the women are communicating their message more appropriately in such a way that they will gain the uh, support of the men who need to like uh, concede this power to them? See, um, you know, the, the, the question you ask, uh, maybe I want to, to, to also say that you, you're putting the burden of responsibility on women. And I don't believe that this is a women's issue. This is an issue for Nigeria, for the yeah. country. You know, so women have to 
communicate the message. The government has to communicate the message mm -hmm. because it's the government of Nigeria that has also committed at the highest level Never. globally um, to do right by all of its citizens and give equal rights to all of its citizens. The men have to also, uh, there, there are men who, who, who are progressive, who understand that this is not about uh, women taking over. It's, it's, if, it's about widening the table Allowing them so to that contribute. more people can mm. be around the table, mm. so that the decisions we make yeah. will be more sustainable. Uh, the decisions we'll make will speak to the realities of everybody in yeah. society. Because um, as much as uh, you, may, you may want to, to disagree, I don't think that a, a man who a man can best speak for a woman um, in the rural community uh, more than a woman. And of course, uh, women, men can, can and do speak for women, yeah. but it is important that the voices of women are heard and that their realities and their perspectives also inform the decision making. Yeah, I was saying that maybe you have to um, educate or inform or just let out some strategies perhaps what the UN has put in place to ensure that their countries, nations, including Nigeria, are able to like walk that very path to ensure that um, this gender parity or equality we're talking about is achieved. Are these strategies being put in place? I know of uh, the he for she, which is really catching up. I'm one of the he for she, and I'm sure there are many <laughs> other men out there <laughs> that are he for she. So what are the strategies are you putting but in place? But what does it mean to be a he for she? So well, it's we... for the interest of the women. Right. So, so there, there are many uh, initiatives, uh, obviously, that what, what we do as the UN is to, to support governments um, to translate these commitments that they make at the global level into national policies at the yeah. national level. And once they do, we provide technical support to the government. And then once they do that, to be able to report on it periodically. Uh, so th that speaks to our normative mandate. And so in, in Nigeria, a lot of the work that we do around advocacy and technical support services is to say, okay, how is the government of Nigeria, which has ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, mm -hmm. how is that being domesticated? The CEDAW Committee in Geneva has asked Nigeria severally on mm -hmm. the different uh, reporting schedules of Nigeria to do this. The committee has asked Nigeria to adopt a gender bill. And every four years, Nigeria reports. The time that Nigeria reports, the, the, the picture is we still don't have a gender bill. We still haven't domesticated CEDAW. So there's a lot of work that we do, but it, it will happen when the government um, uh, actually uh, takes the decision to do that. So we, we definitely support as the United Nations the importance of legislation because that also removes the element of uh, a decision being at the whim of a politician who may be in power today, and if the, that particular politician decides, okay, I'll put, I will allow X num number of women to be in parliament, the next uh, politician who comes will say, no, I'm not going to appoint um, uh, women at all. But when we have legislation, you know it's enshrined in law, so that's one of the important uh, strategies we support. We also support in um, an initiative called the Africa Women Leaders Network, AULIN, which was launched, uh, the Nigeria chapter was launched in July last year and you know the office of the senior special assistant to the president on the SDGs was a, a, a strong partner in the launch of that and, and that network is also one of the tools that we are also using to help mobilize and galvanize women across different sectors um, to unite around common goals. So, so women in business, women in, 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 in the educational sector, market women, women in science, women in politics, that we believe that the, the, the energy and, and the, the strength of women's mobilizing can also change, uh, bring about change. So strategies like he for she, um, which also calls on, women, on men uh, and men across sectors, traditional rulers, traditional leaders, um, men, religious leaders, uh, men in the private sector and so on to say, you know, this work is not just for women. Um, for women, we need to make sure that we support mobilizing all women. 
but we also need to bring about more men. And then this generation equality campaign that we're running this year on the 25th anniversary is also an important strategy because that's, that's putting the emphasis on young people and young women. And it's saying that, you know, 25 years ago, uh, those women who went to Beijing are now uh, much older. Yeah. We're, we're, not, we're today in 2020 talking about development challenges that we will be addressing over the next decade or two. Who is best placed to be at the forefront, at the helm of the discussions? And it's young people. So bringing more young women into the voice to say, look, take ownership of this. So whether we're talking about Aulin, which is saying, bring women and all of their diversity and their networks together. He for she that is saying, bring all of uh, the men into the conversation or generation equality. So these are all movement building uh, initiatives, if you like, uh, which we are also uh, using. In addition to centrally, uh, working to support the government to, 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 through the technical support services that we provide as the United Nations to really move toward in the direction of um, legislation and, and, and then make monitoring and reporting on, on its commitments to women. What exactly is the importance of the achievements of the gender good in the environment SDGs? So I, I, I think we, we are all very pleased for, uh, the, to have a standalone goal on gender equality because um, we believe that if we invest in achieving gender equality, we stand a higher level of success in achieving the other SDGs. Uh, 